UATV English is online and in the air. I hope so. Tom Keating is with us tonight in the studio. Hello, Tom. Hi, nice to meet you. It is indeed nice to meet you too. Tom, can I ask you a direct question? Who are you? What are you doing for living and for, for, for fun? I don't know, but uh, you are a man who knows a lot about sanctions. So who are you? Who am I? A question I ask myself every day. I'm the director of the Finance and Security Research Programme at RUSI, which is a defence and security think tank based in London. So we study matters at the intersection of finance and security, which, of course, in the context of Ukraine, includes sanctions. So uh, I'm struggling to understand all these loopholes and circumventing of sanctions. These sanctions are working or not really? I think you can argue both sides of the story. Uh, people would say because circumvention is occurring, that means that sanctions are working. Oh. People need to find circumvention routes. I think other people who are pulling apart drones and, and missiles that the, the Russian illegal war is uh, delivering on Ukrainian people would say, well, there are still Western components in uh, these missiles and, and drones. So sanctions can't be working. Uh, I would say that they are working, but we need to work harder to make them work better. And exactly what do you mean by that, by making it harder, working it better? What would you do? Very, very simply, I think the, the West has been timid in its use of sanctions. Uh, I, I would agree. say the West is always following. Um, it's not trying to get ahead of the, the Russian military. Have we seen any Western companies punished for their microchips still finding their way into Russian military equipment? No, we haven't. Why have we not? If we really wanted to stop uh, the flow of microchips, if we really wanted to restrict the Russians' uh, resourcing of their, their military, then we would be taking much tougher action on our own companies in the West, but also on the banks and the intermediaries in Central Asia, in the UAE, in Turkey, that are facilitating this trade. We're doing just enough, but there's much more we could do if we really wanted to go tough on this. By, by, uh, by we, you mean Europe, right? Or, or collective I'm West. talking about Europe. I'm talking about Europe. I'm talking about the United States. I'm talking mm. about the United Kingdom. The sanctioning coalition. The sanctioning coalition has two hands. One is like preparing the sanctions, the 14th package, if I'm not mistaken, and the other hand is just just uh, making the loopholes in it. Is that right? Is that what's the the the, the case is now? Look, I think we we spend a lot of time. Uh, admiring the problem, designing <laughs> sanctions, right. talking about them. Indeed. What we're not doing is getting out to companies and saying, these are the sanctions and you, know, you, your microchips have been found in drones that have smashed into Kyiv last night. Uh, it's not acceptable. This is the enforcement penalty that you face for not controlling your supply chains. So, you know, we're, we're doing enough, but not so much that we're actually creating the kind of impact that we need to create in order to support the Ukrainian people. I'd say a um, very, very human thing to do enough, but not really. Um, what about this frozen, I, I, I don't know how to, how to properly say, is it frozen Russian assets abroad in, in, we cannot just take it and give it to Ukraine, which is a good thing. Because this is, you know, like a, uh, uh, a crime against the, the, the private property. How to use it properly. So there I think you're referring to what, what we in Europe refer to as the oligarch assets. You know, the, oligarch the assets. Yachts, That's these the, oligarch assets, the yes. Clubs, <laughs> the yachts, the football clubs, um, yeah, yeah. the yeah. properties. Yeah. Look, I think you know, we spent an awful lot of time in, in Europe, in Canada, in the US, trying to figure out how to take these assets away from the oligarchs in order to support uh, Ukraine. The bottom line is that every time somebody thinks they've come up with a solution, it runs into kind of rule of law issues. Are we really the kinds of people that we don't like you, we're going to expropriate your assets? I mean, that's why personally, I am pleased that actually policymakers have in a way switched their attention from those assets and spent more time focusing on how to use the Russian central bank assets to benefit Ukraine. There, I think there's a much stronger case to make, a much easier case to make, and indeed, as we've recently seen, actually can deliver real money, 50 billion euros in this case, to benefit Ukraine.
Well, well there are a lot of money, of you, a lot of you Russian money in, in, in Europe and in the West. I mean, I, I don't know, 300, million, 300 billion dollars or something like that. What will happen in case, uh, like in two or three or four years with this money? What do you think? Let's speculate. Just what is going on? And let's, let's after Ukraine will win the war. What happens to this money? Is that going back to, to Russia? Is that fair? Or at least it's going to stay with in, in, in a box and nobody knows what to do with it. Let's pay the interest rate to Ukraine, but this money is still Russian. So R Russia can rape and can murder and can burn, but just not exactly. Uh, we, we cannot take this money. What is going on? We finally, maybe we are waiting for a leader that is really in Europe. I mean, that is going to um, say, yeah, well, guys, I mean, that's full stop. This money belongs to, uh, to, to Ukraine because Russia is a terrorist state, because it is a failed state, because it's instigated the war, because Russian nation wanted a tyrant instead of democracy. Or not, we're not even trying. That's enough. But nobody, uh, so, maybe, yeah, well, no, yeah, um, excuse me. Um, that no, was no, 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 one, no one in the West, uh, no one in Europe would dispute the, the, the popular hashtag on social media, Russia must pay. So I, I see no circumstance under which the $300 billion uh, of Russian central bank assets that are currently mainly uh, held in Belgium, I see no circumstance under which those assets ever go anywhere other than Ukraine, either to support Ukraine's victory uh, as long as the war continues or to support the reconstruction of Ukraine as reparations uh, from, from Russia. So I see no circumstance under which those assets go back to Russia. Where it is more complex is the oligarch assets, which ultimately are frozen under sanctions, um, where suggestions have been made that some of those oligarchs should donate some of their assets to support Ukraine. That hasn't got anywhere. Of course, when the war ends, when Ukraine is victorious, um, sanctions at some point will be lifted, and therefore those assets may go back to Mr. Abramovich or Mr. Deripaska, Mr. Rottenberg. So I think the focus should be on ensuring that the central bank assets, the Russian state assets, are used in whatever way is necessary uh, to support Ukraine, its victory and its reconstruction. Let's talk about the personal actions, uh, sanctions, excuse me. Um, you talking about the oligarchs, but the oligarchs are uh, maybe even would be happy to pay a part of their enormous wealth. And then what? They will keep in making money in, in Russia and, and buying like East States in the United Kingdom. You know, and, and nothing really changes. We will be waiting for another war to be financed by Russian money. But Russian money are dollars, are euros, are pounds. And sorry, but that's that's the fact. And nothing really changes. All oh, right, the three three hundred billion. It's good to know it goes to Ukraine, but the system does not really change. Nobody was ready for war before, and nobody is ready now. Nobody knows what to do. At least sanctions are working 14th package, 15, 16, more loopholes, more circumventions and everything. So um, I, I'm not trying to be pushy. I'm just trying to understand myself. Is there any point that when we cross it, we say, OK, that's enough. And after Putin dies, do you believe you personally, Tom, do you believe that anything will change to the better in Russia? Change to the better in Russia? I. Yeah. Who knows? I, that's not a question I, I can answer. What I can tell you is that I, you know, I have the opportunity to to sit in meetings with officials in in Brussels or in Washington or in mm. in London, and the conversations that I have been part of are what I would call game changing conversations. So you know, we we belatedly, very belatedly, uh, in the UK, for example, have learnt a a lesson about welcoming kleptocratic money, welcoming money from corrupt individuals. Um, so I am certain that there are plans being made to ensure that these people can never return to the United Kingdom, that their assets stay frozen, at least, for a very long time. Um, 
So I think, you know, it's it's unconscionable for any country in the West to think that somehow uh, Russia can be Russia and, it, and, and its facilitators can be forgiven uh, for what it has done. So lessons have been learned. They should have been learned 10, 15, 20 years ago, but they have been learned now, I would argue. It is indeed great to hear that detailed and simple answer. Thank you so very much. I would love to talk about the reparations, but I don't know how they work. Do you know how they should work, at least after the Ukraine is victorious, of course? What happens next in terms of reparations, not sanctions? Well, the first thing is, of course, uh, the damage needs to be logged and, and registered. Yeah. I know there is an, right. an active right. process in that regard. Um, and then one needs to come to a, a judgment as to you know, the value uh, of all that that damage. Uh, and then the bill is issued. Um, now, history is not positive on this topic. Uh, I think it took 30 years for the reparations process to conclude in the case of Iraq's unprovoked invasion of Kuwait uh, from 1990, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, that took 30 years to unravel, uh, unroll. Um, and in terms of cost, that was a fraction of the cost that Russia has inflicted on Ukraine. Um, so a very great deal of money will be needed. And I think we can expect the process to take decades, even if the war were to miraculously end tomorrow and Putin was to return to uh, his correct national borders, um, the, the it will take it will take decades, and I think it's going to be very important for the West to ensure that it supports Ukraine, because as a Ukrainian citizen, it it, it will be depressing. It will inevitably de be depressing. You can't rebuild cities and highways and hospitals and infrastructure overnight. These are long term projects. And we from the West need to be doing whatever we can to ensure that Ukraine feels constantly supported through that process. Again, only thank you so very much. I have a lot of questions, a bunch, whole bunch of it, like families of the oligarchs. What happens to, to, to these people? Because they are free. I know personally, and they're living in the United Kingdom, <laughs> spending millions of dollars Dollars, not rubbles, and they are okay. They will be okay, probably. I'm not sure, me, myself, personally, that will we ever see uh, uh, Comrade Putin in The Hague, on the bench, I mean. Do you believe in this? That Putin will... I mean, I think that's very unlikely. Uh, in absentia, I'm, I would very much <laughs> hope to see that occur. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I suspect he won't live to see uh, that that day. I hope not. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, look, I, I think what is very important at the moment, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to be in Berlin mm. recently during the Ukraine recovery conference, and I was concerned uh, by the atmosphere there amongst many kind of Western experts and so on who were thinking great future thoughts about Ukraine. And we all hope that Ukraine uh, has a great future and we want to support that from happening. But right now there is obviously an, an urgency for uh, military equipment, for F-16s, for the, the stuff that, that, that Ukraine needs, not just to defend itself, but to fight back and to take back the territory that has been expropriated from it by by the Kremlin. And I would like to see much more of that dialogue, much more of that we are going to help Ukraine win dialogue, rather than this sense that you tend to get, which is we're going to help Ukraine survive. And meanwhile, we're going to make plans for the future, which, you know, is there a future? Let's be let's let's be realistic. So I would like to see much stronger rhetoric from new leaders in the in the West as as the elections happen across Europe and in the United States, perhaps. Uh, about making sure Ukraine wins, not merely making sure Ukraine survives. Those are two very different things, and we need to be clear on that. Well, talking about human values is a much easier thing than defending these human values, spilling blood for it right now. That's what Ukraine does. So talking is a good thing, you know, when, when you're sitting in a high chair and talk about that. But when Russian missile uh, just, just, just hits your, 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 almost your house, like it happened to me, I'm, I'm living in Ukraine. So you... 
change your point of view like that immediately. I'm not wishing um, a lot of missiles flying over your head in the United Kingdom, but sometimes I really think that if, if, if something like that happens close to... Um, you know, I've heard, uh, I've heard people asking questions to uh, really high-chaired politicians, and they asked... Um, you guess who, Rafael Grossi, who went on Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and everyone was asking, sir, what did you see, what, what is the situation there? And said, it's okay, um, okay, and have you seen Russian mines there? He said, yes, we've seen Russian mines, but that's for safety. <laughs> I want these conversations actually to take place here in Ukraine. I mean, one thing I would <laughs> say in response to that is that the people that, as of course, we should listen to the Ukrainians, but the people that we should be listening to in Europe are those that have experienced occupation Absolutely. in the last generation. You know, leaders in the Baltic states, you know, they should be the ones who are setting the agenda. Um, there are too many countries in, in Europe that don't have that visceral Absolutely. recent historical experience. Um, and you know the the leaders of places like Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Poland, um, uh, Latvia. These are the people that we should be listening to because they know the reality. To your point about missiles, missiles and so on flying overhead, they know the reality of being occupied. Um, in the UK, that's not something we've had to uh, experience, and we should be led by and supporting those who um, uh, who can speak from experience. Absolutely, I cannot agree more. You um, said Lithuania, Estonia, forgetting my native Latvia, where I was born and raised, but you certainly meant that the Baltic states. It's okay. Some some people think Lithuania and Latvia are one in the same country. It is not. I countries. won't make that mistake. No. All right. Okay. So I take that as an answer. And so thank you so very much for your time and for your expertise. It was a lovely conversation. We'd love to do more. I have a lot of questions for you, but we just don't have time. Running out of time this time. And I um, hope to see you soon with us on UATV. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Me too, indeed. Thank you. Was Tom Keating with us in UATV studio? So stay tuned and stay safe, first of all, and tune for more very soon. Goodbye.